But when we look at the world today, um, the world is in a fallen state. The world as it is right now wasn't what God intended from the beginning. So all the problems, all the struggles, everything we see is because the world as we see it right now is in a fallen state. You know, um, growing up, my parents used to tell me, you know, uh, man, I remember when I was younger, I remember what things were like, you know, when I was young, how good things were. And I find myself telling the younger, my younger friends to now, my younger, oh man, in my time, the stuff we had back then, you know, growing up, I don't think you guys can enjoy as much as we did. Now, can you imagine what Adam was telling them back then? Now, can you imagine what I experienced before sin came into the world? Can you imagine what I was experiencing in the Garden of Eden? How God intended for the world to be. Adam must have shared a story with someone, maybe Eve, because uh, they were the only two before they messed up. So he must have shared an amazing story now of how amazing the world was before sin came in. So the world we're in right now is in a fallen state because of sin. Sin came into the world and that's why the world is messed up. Now, to understand what sin is or to understand the problem, sometimes you have to go back to the beginning. To understand what a problem is, you have to go back to the beginning of that problem and try and figure out what went wrong, where did it go wrong, what happened there. I'm in the IT world um, and, you know, I manage databases um, and sometimes they just call you and say the system is down and you begin to ask the application owners or the developers what did you do in the system what did you introduce into the system that has corrupted the system majority of the time they tell you nothing uh, but then you have to start looking for a needle in a haystack trying to figure out what the problem is. because something was introduced because before i left yesterday this database was working fine i come in today and it's down something happened to this database a problem came in i'm epidemiologist uh, my wife is one um, when a disease breaks out, a lot of times they won't go and look for agent zero. That's the person that started that sickness, where it started from. Because once they can get to the source, they can try and figure out a way to fix it, right? So the world we're in right now is because of sin. And for us to understand where we are and how we got here, we need to go back to the origin. I looked at the dictionary and I was looking for um, the definition of sin. And this is what the, um, the dictionary defines sin as. It says, sin is an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. Sin is an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. So when we look at um, Genesis, uh, from Genesis 1, Genesis 1 introduces us to God. Um, in the beginning, God. Genesis 1 talks about the story of creation, how everything was created how man was created. Genesis 2 begins to give us details of how man was created and what happened when God created man. In Genesis 2, it talks about how God gave them instructions. So Genesis 1 and 2 are kind of like together. Genesis 3 is when the problem starts, when sin came into the world. Now let's listen to what God told them in Genesis 2. Um, and I'm going to read from verse, from verse 16. Um, because of time, we'll just go from verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. When you eat from it, you will certainly die. You guys can see our, our tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Yes, <laughs> but it says, When you eat from it, you will certainly die. So let's go to Genesis 3 now, and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 6. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 6, and I'm reading the new, uh, the NIV, the New International Version. Um, I realized that all these dust, dust, dust always affects my tongue, so I decided to go back to NIV. So Genesis 3, from verse 1 to 6, I'm um, reading the NIV. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit, uh, from the fruit, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, our tree right here, and you must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4, 
You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, I'm sure animals used to speak back then because um, Eve wasn't spooked by a serpent coming to talk and talk to her. So animals back then used to speak. Um, I don't know when God closed their mouth, but I think they used to speak. Can we agree on that, everybody? All right. So, but at some point, because she wasn't spooked, a serpent comes to talk to you and you're just having on conversation. Oh, yeah. He just said we shouldn't touch it. We shouldn't. <laughs> so that means it was normal. In their daily activities, they are walking, they see a line, they say, hey, what's up? So animals used to speak back then. But here she's having a full-blown conversation with this serpent. And we, of course, know that the, the devil had entered the serpent. You know, I don't have a problem with Eve here. The f- person I have a problem with is Adam. Because all this while, Adam was standing right next to her. But, you know, <laughs> he was standing right next to her, and he hears a serpent speaking to his wife, and this guy said nothing. Maybe she had warned him that day, if you talk when we go out today. <laughs> you know, married folks, sometimes we are funny like that. We have arguments and you go out and you guys are not speaking to each other, but you're speaking to everybody else and everybody's just hunky dory going on. But he was standing right there and he said nothing. And that's why it's important for men, fathers, to be very protective of your household. Be careful who's speaking into your family. Be careful who's speaking over your children, speaking stuff. So it was a failure of Adam. We're going to blame Eve, but it was Adam's failure. (laughs) But here, (laughs) the serpent is speaking to her, and she sees everything. Now, if we go to 1 John 2, verse 16, 1 John 2, verse 16, the Bible tells us something. It says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Sin happens when we yield to temptation. Sin happens when we yield to temptation. And temptation normally comes to us in these three main categories. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. If you look at sin, any sin, they fall in these three categories. is lust of the flesh lust of the eyes, or pride of life. So I'm sure Eve must have been passing that tree daily because we don't know how long she was standing there, but she passed that tree daily and looks at it, you know, walks away again. Maybe two weeks later, she's passing near it. And she keeps walking. A month later, she comes back. And now she's looking at it. And to her, they say, don't touch it. So she looks really close. But doesn't touch it. And then goes. And eventually, someday, she's standing by that tree because the devil came to her while she was by that tree. Not anywhere else in the garden, but she was by there, the same place she had passed. And she had been looking at it. And the devil comes right there. And right there and then, he begins to talk to her. And it's broken down into three. And he uses these three tactics on her. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, if we go back to Genesis where we read, um, Genesis 3, and we're going to read again from verse 1 to 6. And tell me if you can spot all three. Uh, we're going to have a quiz after the service. So Genesis 3, 1 to 6, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Do you, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruits from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not, let that not die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Did anybody spot it yet? All right. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree 
was good for food. It was pleasing to the eye. And that she will be like God, knowing good and evil. She took some of it, ate it, and gave it to Adam, who was standing right next to her. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three things are how temptation comes in. Now, if we fast forward to when Jesus came in, and let's see if we can spot this same thing. Um, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, now Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. This guy was about to begin his ministry. So Jesus is being tempted by the devil here. And let me see if you can spot it as well. Matthew 4, um, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 11. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. This is the devil quoting the scripture back to Jesus. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God. Serve him only. Verse 11, The devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Now, did anybody spot those three things again? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All right, we have a table up that will be able to help us. So let's see their responses. When the enemy came at Jesus, in verse 3 of Matthew 4, it says, Command the stones to be turned into bread. But he answered him, It says, Written, man shall not live by bread alone. When it was Eve's turn, he says, Did God say you must not really, really eat from this tree? She said, We may eat from it, but would God say we must not touch it? Remember when God gave Adam the instruction, all he said was, You must not eat from it. Eve added her own part saying, you know what? He said we shouldn't eat it and we shouldn't touch it. You know why? Because a lot of times when we want to sin, we try to desensitize it. We try to make it look so difficult sometimes that we can give ourselves room. Because I mean, God put them in the garden to tend the garden. So she must have been able to take care of that tree. That's why sometimes the things God puts in your hands is not for you to consume. Because you're working and you're having handling money and finances doesn't mean it's for you. Because you're a counselor taking care of children doesn't mean you should abuse them. Because it's going to put things in your hand, but you are going to take care of it, but don't eat it. Don't eat it, was what he told them. The second thing was the lust of the eyes. And again, the devil took him. Now, he switched it up here for Jesus before he did the lust of... Um, the flesh, um, eyes, and the pride of life. But he switched it up for Jesus. And this is because he went down to Matthew um, 4, verse 8. And it says, again, the devil taking him up to the exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And Jesus said, get thee from me, Satan, for it is written, thou must worship the Lord thy God only. Eve's response was, when she saw that it was good, she was going to get it. And the final one was the pride of life. Four, Matthew 4 verse 6 it says if thou be the son of God cast thyself down that means you know God got your back hey God said he's going to protect you God says he's going to watch over you there's nothing that can happen to you so you can speed 120 or 495 and nothing is going to happen to you God said he's going to watch you so you know what next time you're on a plane just pull that exit side and jump out <laughs> because God said he's going to catch you and Jesus' answer to him was, you must not tempt the Lord your God. Just because God said he's going to protect us doesn't mean we should be reckless with our lives. 
The question is then, how do we overcome temptation? And I'm trying to move fast here. The first thing we need to know is that we need to know God's word. We need to know God's word because when the enemy came at Jesus, he came at him with the word. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. The difference between Eve and Jesus was that someone had the revelation of the word because Jesus at a young age studied the scriptures. Eve was told by this. It was just commercial knowledge that she had. That's why she was able to add her own. He says, don't eat and don't touch. Each of us as children of God must learn to know the word of God for ourselves. That's why nobody can come and tell you anything. Oh, I, I dreamt about you. Something happened. Fine. I can go and pray my God myself. I remember when my wife and I were believing in God for children and Someone came to come and meet me. Oh, you know what? I know this pastor that can pray for you to have kids. And I'm looking at him like, I'm a Christian myself. <laughs> and I have a relationship with God. I don't need nobody to pray for me. Now, it's fine when people pray for us. It's a good thing. But don't come and tell me I need to go see someone so that God can answer my prayers. Nah. <laughs> Each of us as children of God, must learn to know God's word ourselves. That's why when the enemy comes in with different things, you'll be able to speak back to him. But Jesus knew the word, and that's why he was able to come after him. The second thing is we need to learn to pray. Learn to pray. We're having night vigil in two weeks or three weeks thereabouts, so please come and pray. We pray every morning, but learn to pray. When I was young, I used to hear this thing that I thought it was cliche, that a, a, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. And that's the honest truth. Jesus spent time praying. He spent time praying. You might not be the one that can pray for 24 hours, but in the five minutes that you can pray, let your prayer. The Bible says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous avail it much. Every one of us needs to learn how to pray. Matthew 26, verse 41, Jesus said, Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I know sin is heavy. That's why we have ice cream after service, guys. So <laughs> we'll cool us down a bit after. <laughs> but learn to pray. The third way we can overcome temptation is to understand your weakness. Understand your weakness. James 1, verse 14 to 6. It's, but, it says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. It's funny how, I don't know if it happens to you, but you choose a day you want to fast. Like, man, today I'm going to fast. And then you show up to the office and then, oh, it's free donuts for everybody this month. <laughs> Or you show up, I'm like, I'm fasting. And then one of your friends says, hey, I just found this restaurant. Send you a picture of this food. Like, hey. <laughs> Join me for lunch. <laughs> but it always happens when you decided to fast. Anybody ever have? I mean, God is still trying to deliver. Because in those times, I just, I just super fast my fast. <laughs> But each one of us needs to know our weaknesses. In those ins wow. <laughs> we need to understand our weaknesses. You know, and this is just a joke. I didn't read this in the Bible. Just, this is just a joke. But I think Jesus really liked bread. <laughs> and the reason I say that is, if you see, he called himself the bread of life. And when he came, he broke bread. <laughs> when he was going to feed the 5,000, it was bread again. So I think Jesus really liked bread. So that's why when the enemy came, the guy just told him, hey, turn these stones to bread. <laughs> but each of us needs to, <laughs> we need to understand our weaknesses. We need to set boundaries. If it's that five, six foot, six pack, making six figures guy, six, six, six. <laughs> If it's that guy that's going to cause you to sin, you have to set your boundaries. But each one of us needs to understand our weaknesses. If it's the guy that nice, petite, light skin. <laughs> Some people I, have to I had to stop following on Instagram. 
Social media is just bad these days, bad. I mean, you don't even look for it, they even suggest. <laughs> Do you want to follow this person? <laughs> That's how bad it's gotten. But each of us needs to understand our weaknesses. We need to understand and set our boundaries. So the first thing is, the second thing is, the third thing is, and the fourth thing is that we need to be on guard. First Peter 5 verse 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. John 10, 10 tells us that the, the enemy comes to, to kill, see, and destroy. So he's looking, always looking for an opening. I think I shared this story before, but about two years ago, um, it was during um, fall season, and we had a lot of leaves in front of my house. And I just were like, I was tired. I, was on, I just used to kick it with my leg just to make way. But it was a lot of leaves. I remember this night, we went out, um, the family, my wife, the kids, my mom, we all went out and we're coming back home and it's dark out. So normally when we get home, we just leave the door open to try and get them out of their car seats and put them inside. So we're standing there and the door is wide open. So I'm trying to put them in and right as we put, <laughs> I think it was Buddy in, my last son, a rat runs into the house. So a rat runs into the house and we shut the door. I mean, my wife is now in, I think she was in Virginia by now. But everybody runs, my mom runs, and now we took the kids upstairs. The truth is, I'm afraid of losing to myself. So my wife is like, man, we're not sleeping in this house. It says we can't sleep in this house. And now I'm just standing here like, what am I gonna do? But I left the door open long enough for the rat to come in. So I'm standing there now, and she's like, you know what, we need to either go to a hotel or something, but I am not sleeping in this house. Our children are here. What if they're playing on the floor one of these days and the rat comes, I just... So, is there a big, oh. So now, we, everybody goes upstairs and I had to block, I block the downstairs, I put boxes and everything, I block everything and everyone is upstairs. Now they're looking at Wally to go and kill this. <laughs> and here I am. I'm afraid of rodents myself. So I just said a simple prayer. I said, God, please just help me, you know? Help me. And my mom said, I think this thing went into the clothes closet. So we start to block the place and we're taking everything out. And in my mind, I mean, if this thing should jump out at me, we got rid of the rats because of Peter. I'm not going to say what happened, but. But we're able to get rid of the rat. But the, but, but, but the question is, how many times do we leave our doors open for the enemy to come in? When we're not on guard, how many times do we leave the door open that the enemy can slid right in? Because the enemy is seeking, he's just waiting. Waiting. I think it was in Job when the Bible says that the sons of God gathered and even the enemy came there too. So the enemy is there just waiting to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So the first thing is that we need to know God's word. The second thing is we need to learn to pray. The third thing is we need to understand our weaknesses. The fourth thing is we need to be on God. The fifth thing is that we need to resist the devil. James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Being tempted is not a sin. Being tempted, when you are tempted to do something, is not a sin. When it becomes sin is when you act on it. When you act on it is when it becomes sin. So in those situations where you are seeing things that are, are making you question, like, oh, is this thing good or not? Because a lot of times, um, there's this book by John Bever called Good or Great, um, Good or God, sorry. How many people have read that book? Good or God, I recommend, it to, uh, I recommend everyone to read that book. It's called Good or God. But it talks about a lot of times what the enemy comes us, uh, at us with is not something bad, it's something good. And that's how we miss it because it seems good. If you remember what Eve said, it says it looked good to her. It didn't look bad to her. 
So when those times, when, it, when, when, when you begin to question, is this what God would have me do? And you know <laughs> that you don't have peace in your heart about it. When it's, when it's borderline, is it good or is it God? Choose God and not choose good. <laughs> choose God and not good. The sixth and final thing um, we need to do is flee. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22 says, Flee. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, we always, um, I, I love Joseph a lot, and that's one of the stories I studied a lot, Joseph, because of how he was able to deal with everything he went through. But Joseph got to a point in his life that he was being tempted by Potiphar's wife. I think Joseph had an attraction to that woman because he tried and stayed there, but he decided he wasn't going to sin. And if you remember what he said, he said, I'm not going to sin against God. And when he realized that he's used the word, he's used his boundaries, everything, finally he said, well, I'm just going to run out of this place. So sometimes when you've done all you can and it's still not working, you need to flee. Or run away from that situation. I would rather be on God's side than on the side of the enemy. I'd rather flee from a situation and lose out and be in right standing with God. Now it might look weird to you. Someone might look at you and say, you know, it's crazy. Can you imagine this guy? I offered myself to him and he walked away from it, all of this. <laughs> Can you imagine this guy walked away from that business deal? He was going to make at least $3 million on the back end if he just did it this way. It wouldn't look like normal behavior. It might look crazy today, but the Bible lets us know that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar kind of people. We're different. We're different. We can't be like the rest. Now then what happens when sometimes we take a bite of the forbidden fruit? What happens sometimes when we've done all we can and sometimes we make mistakes? And we take that fruit. And we take a bite of it. The truth of the matter is that God never stops loving us when we bite it. His love remains. Now, if you come next week, I promise you we're going to talk about how to deal with when you've fallen into sin. But God is here to restore. He doesn't condemn each, he doesn't condemn anyone. There's nothing you can do that can separate you from God's love. The Bible lets us know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The reason God had to kick Adam and Eve out of the garden was so that he can redeem them later. If he left them in the garden and they ate the tree of life, then we're damned. That's it. But he kicked them out because he was going to send Jesus out later to go redeem them. Let's bow down our heads. Father, we thank you for this few minutes we've been able to talk about your word. Lord, each and every one of us that's represented here face temptations on a daily basis. Sometimes it's daily, sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's monthly. But each and every one of us face the forbidden fruit. Lord, we're asking for strength this week in the name of Jesus. Just as you taught the disciples to pray that, lead us not into temptation. Lord, we're asking that you lead us not into temptation this week in the name of Jesus. For those of us that are weak, strengthen us. And for those of us who've taken a bite out of the fruit, Father, restore us in the name of Jesus. Bring us back to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Now, um, we're still every head bowed and every eye closed. Um, it won't be right if we don't do this. But for us to get back to where we need to get to and where God wants us to be, we need to have a relationship with him. We need to submit ourselves to him. 
If you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, this is the perfect time to do it because God's arms are wide open waiting for you. So let us all say this prayer together. Father, I thank you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to redeem me for my sins. I confess that I'm a sinner and I repent today. I ask that Jesus comes into my life and be my personal Lord and Savior. I'm turning from my old way and I'm starting a new walk with you. In Jesus' name. Now, if this is your first time seeing the salvation prayer, there are some connect cards that we handed out earlier. Um, please indicate in there and someone will reach out to you during the week. Um, but I pray that as you go into this week, God will strengthen you and that you will not be tempted by the forbidden fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm -hmm. God bless. Mm -hmm.